I don't like tournament arcs in anime. They usually stick to the same old script. You know, that predictable formula where you know the outcome of every battle before it even starts. Even the ones I adore suffer from this rinse and repeat routine, and the ones that attempt to shake things up often end up going too far from what makes a tournament arc, well, a tournament arc. But there's this one arc that gets it just right, not leaning too heavily into the tropes, but still keeping that tournament format intact. Enter Duelist Kingdom, the first tournament arc in Yu-Gi-Oh! Now, before we dive into the story, we need to talk about localization. I don't want to spend too much time on this because I mentioned four kids in almost every video, but here's the thing. One of the big reasons people don't hold Yu-Gi-Oh! in the same regard as many of the other anime of its time is the localization. While most popular anime were dubbed by Funimation, Yu-Gi-Oh! landed in the hands of four kids. And as the name suggests, four kids caters to kids. So even though Yu-Gi-Oh! was initially aimed at young adults, 4Kids saw the merchandising potential and decided it had to be aimed at children when they got the dubbing license. The CEO even admitted in a 2005 interview with Anime News Network that merchandise is the top priority when determining which properties to bring over from Japan. And as a series where fictional trading cards take center stage, Yu-Gi-Oh! was a prime target, a marketing match made in heaven, especially when you consider that Pokemon cards were a huge hit around the same time. The result? A heavily sanitized version of the Yu-Gi-Oh! anime. Also, children as young as six would be able to watch it. Now, don't get me wrong. The 4Kids dub certainly has its place. I don't think Yu-Gi-Oh! would have been nearly as popular if it wasn't altered so much for the Western audience. It probably wouldn't have even aired considering all of the religious references in the visuals. And sure, some of the changes were actually improvements over the Japanese version. Eric Stewart's portrayal of Seto Kaiba is easily the best one. There's no debating that. But I can't in good conscience recommend the 4Kids dub because it has so much less to offer. Everything from the story and characters to the visuals and even the sound design. The Japanese version is simply better. So for this video, that's the version that we'll be focusing on. And at times I'll be referencing the manga as well. So you can expect to hear different names for some of the characters, cards, and pretty much everything else. Oh, and hey, one last thing. Do yourself a solid, hit that like button, and subscribe for more anime analysis videos. The story kicks off in episode 1. Seto Kaiba, the resident rich kid, finds out Yugi's grandpa has a copy of Blue Eyes White Dragon, which is one of the rarest and most powerful cards in the Duel Monsters card game. Kaiba tries to buy the card, but Yugi's grandpa says it's not for sale. Then Kaiba does what any other reasonable person would do in the situation, and he kidnaps the old man, snatches the card away, and tears it in half. When Yugi gets wind of this, he confronts Kaiba and completely obliterates him using Exodia the Forbidden One, the strongest monster in the entire game. Yugi's grandpa is returned and they live happily ever after. Until episode 2. You see, when Yugi faced Kaiba, Kaiba was considered the best dual monsters player in the world. News of Yugi's victory spread like wildfire, turning him into an overnight celebrity. And as a result of this, Yugi receives a magical VHS tape containing a live video of Pegasus the creator of Duel Monsters. Pegasus freezes time using his Millennium Eye and challenges Yugi to a shadow game through the TV. Pegasus wins the duel and snatches the soul of Yugi's grandpa as his prize. Then he tells Yugi that the only way to rescue his grandpa is by defeating him in a rematch in the finals of the Duelist Kingdom tournament. So yeah, the setup for this arc is pretty standard. Most tournament arcs usually boil down to, I've gotta win this thing or else someone's gonna die. And on the surface, Duelist Kingdom is no different. But the main thing holding tournament arcs back is the lack of danger. We know the heroes will win as soon as something significant is at stake, which robs us of the suspense in the battles. But here's why Duelist Kingdom is different. It does an excellent job of overcoming this issue by repeatedly casting doubt over the main character. And the first instance happens almost immediately. After Yugi's grandpa gets kidnapped by Pegasus, Yugi has no choice but to enter the tournament, so the next day, he hops on a ship heading to Duelist Kingdom Island. While on the ship, he meets some fellow competitors, and one of them, named Haga, claims to be a fan. Haga approaches Yugi on the ship's deck and asks if he can see the Exodia cards. Yugi's like, I don't see why not, and he hands them over, only to regret it instantly as Haga tosses the cards into the ocean. Now, most people remember this scene for its comedic qualities because it's one of the most memed moments in the entire series, but it's also one of the most pivotal moments in the entire franchise. 
When Yugi lost Exodia, he essentially lost his plot armor. Sure, he's still the main character, but the only reason Yugi beat Kaiba, which got him into the situation in the first place, is because he had the strongest monster in the game. Now that he doesn't, how's he supposed to win? He barely scraped by against Kaiba, now he's up against Pegasus, the creator of the game itself, not to mention all the other top duelists from around the world who were also invited. Without Exodia, Yugi no longer has that aura of invincibility. He's beatable now. The scene is also important because of what Exodia represented in the series at the time. The reason Exodia is a monster comprised of five different pieces is because Yugi's friend group consists of five different people. Joey, Tristan, Anzu, the Pharaoh, and himself. In the 1998 Toei adaptation, the fifth person is Miho, but she's not his friend in the manga, so she didn't make it to the 2000s anime adaptation. Anyway, the story arcs preceding Duelist Kingdom are about multiple different games, so none of the rules are fully fleshed out like the card game is today. That's why it was okay for cards like Exodia to appear out of nowhere. It wasn't about the game, it was about the power of friendship and Exodia was used in the final battle of the Death T arc, which was originally supposed to be the last one with the card game in the manga. But the cards were so popular, despite being a parody of Magic the Gathering, that people would call into Jump Headquarters and ask if the game was real. When Takahashi found out that people were enjoying it so much, he decided to bring it back. And that's why, after a brief intermission with the Monster World arc, he went all in on the Duel Monsters card game. So deciding to toss Exodia into the ocean did two things. One, it erased Yugi's friendship plot armor, and two, it established that this game would have a future. Before we continue, I need to give a quick shout out to the sponsor of this video, Manta Sleep. These guys are the real deal when it comes to crafting the world's best sleep masks and functional sleep gear. Manta works every day to improve and optimize sleep so that you can have the energy to crush each day with full-on energy. Their sleep masks are like a cloud on your face, super soft, breathable, and you can adjust them however you want. The eye cups are game changers because they put zero pressure on your eyes, even if you're a side sleeper like me. Now, personally, I use the Manta Silk Mask. The material is just unreal. But they've got different masks for all kinds of sleepers, so everyone's covered. You can check out all the different masks available by visiting Manta Sleep using the link in the description of this video. And if you use code ENIGMA at checkout, you will receive 10% off your order. So a big thank you to Manta Sleep for sponsoring this video. Now let's get back to it. Shortly after losing Exodia, we start to doubt Yugi again, when we discover the true reason behind his invite to Duelist Kingdom. Isn't it weird that Pegasus had to kidnap someone to get Yugi to join his event? Is he really that desperate to have the best of the best in his tournament? Seems kind of nuts, right? Well, that's because it's bigger than that. When Yugi beat Kaiba, Kaiba's company took a financial nosedive. After being dethroned, Kaiba went into hiding to figure out how to beat Yugi and reclaim his title, and his board of investors saw his absence as the perfect opportunity to find a new face for the company. Naturally, they approached Pegasus since he is the creator of Duel Monsters cards, and Kaiba Corporation is the leading games company. But there's a catch. Pegasus could only replace Kaiba if he beat Yugi in a duel. This would solidify Pegasus as the best Duel Monsters player and restore the company's reputation. This is why Pegasus set up the Duelist Kingdom tournament and kidnapped Yugi's grandpa. But he didn't stop there. He kidnapped Mokuba as well to lure Kaiba to the island. This way, Pegasus can prevent Kaiba from reclaiming the company before he makes his move. But not long after Yugi arrives, Mokuba escapes his prison cell and finds Yugi on the island. He tells Yugi about what Pegasus is doing to him and his brother behind the scenes. Initially, he blames Yugi for the situation, but then he realizes that Yugi isn't the bad guy in all this. Mokuba agrees to team up with Yugi, but then he's captured again right after that. The next day, Kaiba shows up to rescue his brother, and now that we have this newfound knowledge of what he's been going through, it's suddenly become a lot more difficult to root against him. After hearing Mokuba's story, we no longer see him as this evil force. Don't get me wrong, Kaiba is solely responsible for the situation that he's in. If he wasn't willing to go so far to obtain a mere Duel Monsters card, this entire situation could have been avoided. But we still want him to rescue his brother from Pegasus. But just as we start to sympathize with Kaiba, he crosses paths with Yugi. The two of them agree to duel each other to determine who will move on to challenge Pegasus in the finals. And Kaiba actually wins. Okay, so that doesn't exactly paint the full picture. It was a very close match, but when the tide started to shift in Yugi's favor, Kaiba employed a dirty tactic. He walked backwards until he was standing on a cliff. This way, Yugi's next attack would send him over the edge. 
Yuki didn't want to be responsible for Kaiba's death, even if it meant saving his grandpa, so he forfeit the match. I know the ending to this duel is very frustrating, but there are a ton of layers to the ending sequence that often go overlooked. First of all, and I hate to do this so much, we have to go back to the first episode. After Kaiba lost to Exodia, Yugi used his Millennium Item to crush the evil within Kaiba's heart. Without the Season Zero context, it's hard to pick up on this or even to understand what it means, but in the arcs that take place before Duelist Kingdom, the Pharaoh is not a good guy. He was very cruel to his opponents, and even though some of them deserve to be punished, and he was doing it for the benefit of Yugi and his friends, the Pharaoh definitely went overboard a lot of the time. I went into further detail about this in an older video, so watch that if you want more specifics, or go check out the Season Zero part of the manga. But basically, the regular Yugi is much more kind-hearted than the Pharaoh who was awakened by the puzzle, and by the time he reaches Kaiba for the battle to rescue his grandpa, Yugi's kindness had rubbed off on him to the point that he decided to help redeem Kaiba, rather than punish him. The scene is largely glossed over in the anime version of Duelist Kingdom, mainly due to the lack of Season Zero's context, so again, I understand why this particular aspect is often missed, but there are still signs of this in the anime. Anyway, Yugi's mind crush actually worked. Kaiba is now a redeemed person, and that's precisely why the duel played out the way that it did. The way he won seemed pretty scummy, and it kinda was from a competitive standpoint because it paints Kaiba as a sore loser who will do anything to get a win. But the one who suffered the most from the outcome of that duel was Kaiba. For all of Kaiba's faults, he is not a cheater, so for him to stoop as low as he did was completely out of character. But he did what he had to because he's not fighting for himself anymore. He must rescue Mokuba and preserve his life's work as the CEO of Kaiba Corporation. So for Kaiba to win in this way, as frustrating as it is to see, it's anything but selfish. It's still dirty, but that's the point. Kaiba set his pride aside for the first time ever in order to avenge the loss that got him into this mess in the first place. He cheapened his own win because what's more valuable than truly settling the rivalry is rescuing his brother, even if it means humiliating himself in front of his rival. And if you're wondering why he didn't just team up with Yugi, there's a scene in the manga where Pegasus tells Kaiba that only one of them can enter the castle to face him. So Kaiba waits outside the castle until Yugi arrives and then tries to eliminate him from the tournament. As for Yugi, the uncertainties in his path intensify. The once invincible protagonist now grapples with another major setback, setting the stage for another departure from the typical trajectory. Now let's dive into my absolute favorite aspect of Duelist Kingdom, and one I believe is the most important in terms of all tournament arcs, the competitors. Most tournament arcs throw in just way too many filler characters. You know, the punching bags who are used to build anticipation for a clash between the main character and his chief rival. Sometimes there are exceptions to this like the Rock Lee vs. Gara fight in Naruto. The battle feels a lot bigger than it is, despite being a setup fight. But battles like this are few and far between. What's great about Duelist Kingdom is it's pretty much the complete opposite. Instead of drowning us in fodder, wasting our time with battles between characters we don't care for, it serves up a bunch of standouts, which in turn provides us with a lot better battles. Let's start with Yugi's friend Joey. The night before the tournament, he discovers that his sister will lose her eyesight unless he makes a ton of money in a short amount of time. And of course, Yugi is probably willing to share the prize money if he wins since he's only there to save his grandpa. But there's no guarantee that Yugi will win, so Joey sneaks onto the ship and enters illegally. And at the start, it may seem like Joey has no chance of winning the tournament, but that notion is quickly shot down as Joey piles win on top of win over the course of the arc. First, he goes up against Mai Kujaku, who is no slouch. In fact, she's winning the duel until Yugi gives Joey a hint on how to win. In the second duel, Joey takes a step down in competition as he attempts to win for the first time without the help of his friends. Although he still has some cards that he got from Yugi and he still has his friends watching over him. Joey wins the duel and he gets a really cool prize, the Red Eyes Black Dragon card. Later that night, Joey finds Kaiba on the island and due to his newfound confidence, he challenges him to a duel. Kaiba beats him so bad that he starts to doubt himself again. The next day, Joey is lured from the rest of his group and forced to duel against Bones. But there's a catch. Bones is not alone. With him are three others, and two of them aren't really important, but one of them is Bandit Keith, the number one player in America. During the duel, Joey gets really frustrated because every time Bones is about to do something, Bandit Keith whispers something in his ear and then he does something else. This is one of my favorite duels in the series because it places Joey on the receiving end of a strategy that he himself was using against others up to this point. In this duel, Joey is up against a jobber, basically a bum who doesn't even belong on the island. 
but this person is being helped by the number one player in America. And if you look at Joey's first duel in the tournament from his opponent's perspective, it was Mai up against some bum being helped by the number one player in Japan. It really puts things into perspective. Joey could be seen as a cheater since he was being helped so much by Yugi. Is it the power of friendship or is it blatant cheating? It feels like another attempt to tone down the power of friendship in order to elevate actual game strategy. And I think they did a fantastic job. Now let's jump ahead to the finals of Duelist Kingdom. By this point, Kaiba has already lost to Pegasus and Yugi has earned his way back in. There are only four duelists remaining, Yugi, Joey, Mai, and Bandit Keith. The winner gets to face Pegasus for the prize money. The opponents are randomized. Yugi gets paired with Mai and Joey's first match is up against Bandit Keith. With this, he has a chance at beating him for real since technically he already beat him by proxy. Joey wins, officially establishing himself as a real contender and now that he's beaten a former champ, he feels like a real threat to Yugi. It's easy to look back on this duel after the fact and say, of course Yugi was going to win, because of course Yugi does win. But after reading the manga, I realized that Joey was being set up for a potential win over Yugi. If you take into account all of Joey's come-ups in this arc, and then contrast them with all of Yugi's downfalls that started around the same time, and then consider they're both friends fighting for the same reason, either guy could have won. I know that still sounds kinda crazy, especially since Yugi is the main character and Yugi does win in the anime. But get this, in the manga, this duel never even happened. When the two were matched up against each other, Yugi felt he would have to go all out against Joey. But he didn't want to reveal all of his strategies to Pegasus, who was watching every duel of the tournament. So Joey decided to let Yugi move on to the final battle. And even though I feel like giving Yugi a win here undercuts the duels that happen later in Battle City, everyone would have felt like they got robbed if they didn't get a duel between the two. Either way, both versions did a great job of building Joey into a future rival for Yugi. But enough about these two. What about the other finalists? Let's start with Bandit Keith. So Bandit Keith was not actually invited to Duel's Kingdom. Yes, he was the number one player in America, but he lost that title some time ago. At the finals of a big tournament, Pegasus was supposed to face the winner, and Bandit Keith made it to the finale, but he decided to pull a switcheroo, inviting a child from the audience to duel in his place. Pegasus wrote some notes down on a piece of paper, handed it to the kid, and then sat back and watched as Bandit Keith was completely humiliated. After he lost, Bandit Keith took the piece of paper and screamed in horror as it dawned on him that Pegasus predicted all of his moves and wrote them down before the duel even began. Keith was so crushed by this defeat that he quit dueling altogether and fell victim to alcohol and gambling addiction where he would frequently bet his own life in games of Russian Roulette. When the Duelist Kingdom tournament was announced, Keith saw it as an opportunity to get even with Pegasus, but he was so crushed by his last defeat at the hands of Pegasus that he refused to play Duel Monsters. This is why he was hanging out with three other duelists during the Joey duel. His mission was to help them earn their way into the finals and then steal their entrance fees and use it to get close to Pegasus. It's crazy how low his confidence was during this tournament. Occasionally he would boast about being a former champ and talk down to the others, but the facade crumbles when Keith finally has no choice but to play a duel. When Pegasus announces the final matchups, he reveals a special card is needed in order to participate. Keith doesn't have one since he wasn't really invited, so he steals Joey's. And get this, Keith starts questioning the commissioner, hoping for a disqualification and a free pass to the finals. This guy will do anything to avoid losing. Luckily for Joey, Mai was already eliminated by Yugi, so she offered her special card to Joey as a parting gift. Joey accepted, and Keith's plans were foiled. But Keith doesn't stop with the dirty tricks there. During the duel, he whips out an extra card from his wristband. But what's funny is, Mai actually didn't play fair either. People don't really think of Mai as a cheater, not as much as Bandit Keith, probably because her tricks are more subtle than Bandit Keith's. She sprays her cards with different perfumes so she can tell what they are without looking. It's more of a mind game tactic, but it's still cheating since she can know what's on top of her deck before she even draws it. However, despite both being cheaters, Duelist Kingdom depicts the two in very different ways. On one hand, we have Mai who gets exposed very quickly. Joey calls out her perfume tactic during their duel at the beginning of the arc. And when she's exposed, she realizes that she's been carried by a cheap trick. From then on, she decides to drop it and focus on actually improving at playing duel monsters. Then she helps Joey, even though he's the one who exposed her. My story is one of redemption. Bandit Keith, on the other hand, is a cautionary tale. A tale of a once honorable player who avoid playing at all if it means minimizing his risk of losing. And I love this aspect of Duelist Kingdom. The way these players push the boundaries to avoid a fair fight, even though they're the best in the world. It's so realistic. 
You'd think top competitors wouldn't stoop to cheating, but that's how it really goes in high stakes competition. Where's the cheat? Whoa, whoa. I've seen boxers tamper with their gloves for extra damage. MMA fighters pretend to be knocked out by illegal moves that didn't even land. This way they could win by disqualification. Not to mention all the doping scandals that exist in nearly every sport. But the crazy thing is, nobody takes it further than Pegasus, and his Duel Monsters deck is very emblematic of that. Up front, we have the Toons, which represent the bubbly persona that he puts on for the general public. But in the final duel with Yugi, Pegasus resorts to his Illusion Monsters, like Relinquished and Thousand Eyes Restrict. These monsters represent the sacrifices that Pegasus is willing to make, and the things that he won't hesitate to snatch away. Relinquished is one of the first ritual monsters, one of the first cards in the anime that requires other monsters to be sacrificed in order to summon it, since you know, they didn't tribute summon back then. And its effect allows you to take your opponent's monster and use it against them. I mean, how fitting is that? Relinquished alone encapsulates the entire plot of Duelist Kingdom. But now it's time to address the elephant in the room, the rules. Even people who like Duelist Kingdom will tell you it's held back by the fact that the rules make no sense. And I disagree, sort of. While the wonky rules may dampen the battles, I think it's important to understand the reason behind the chaos. The biggest factor is the timing when the anime aired relative to when the real card game first released. When the official card game came out in Japan, Duelist Kingdom was already nearing its conclusion in the manga, so there were literally no rules when Takahashi wrote it. But in the United States, where the franchise really took off and became a worldwide sensation, the cards and the anime were released around the same time, and most fans discovered Yu-Gi-Oh through the anime. That's what led to the popularity of the cards, not the other way around. This is why most of the players in the early days adopted what we call middle school rules. These were a loose interpretation of the game mechanics seen in the Duelist Kingdom arc of the anime. Tribute summoning was ignored, card effects varied from what was actually written on them, and life points were usually less than 8,000. There were some kids who actually read the rule book, which came with the starter decks, but the vast majority of people stuck with the simplified rules from the anime. And this obviously changed in the years to come, but the point is, back when Duelist Kingdom initially aired, when the game was at its peak in terms of popularity, the rules weren't a priority for most viewers. The story and the spectacle of the card battles overshadowed any rule discrepancies. But as time went on, fans of the Yu-Gi-Oh! anime grew into hardcore players of the Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG. And with that, the inconsistencies became glaringly obvious. And I accept that this is the reality going forward. We can't just go into a time machine and reset our perception of Duelist Kingdom to what it was back then. But it's important to understand that the main goal of the anime, as is true of any other, is entertainment. Both the Yu-Gi-Oh! anime and the manga are storytelling mediums meant to engage and captivate, not a tutorial on how to play some game. So while Duelist Kingdom tends to stray from the modern reality of the Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG, focusing on the narrative and the characters is where you will find the best viewing experience. But those are just my thoughts, leave yours down below, and thanks again to Manta Sleep for sponsoring this video. Thanks for watching.